start our sermon series called The Guardian, in which we are studying the Ten Commandments. It's only right that we kick it off by reading the commandments, listening to the commandments as God first gave them through Moses to God's people. So in just a minute, we're going to do that. But first, I want to give you one fun fact and one task, okay? Here's the fun fact. Did you know that the commandments can really be divided up into two parts? And it's not evenly down the middle. It's in where the command is directed. The first three commandments are all dealing with your relationship with God. The last seven commandments all deal with your relationship with your neighbor. We talk about two tables or two tables of the law. The first table deals with your relationship with God. The second, your relationship with your neighbor. And that's why when Jesus was asked in Matthew's gospel, what is the greatest commandment? What was he able to say? The first and the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The whole of the law is summarized in these two commandments, Jesus says. Love. Love God. Love your neighbor. That's your fun fact. Here is your fun task. Are you ready? And maybe it's not so fun because what I'm going to ask you to do is a little bit of introspection this morning. I'm going to ask you to think about your feelings And maybe on America's birthday, that's the most un-American thing to do, is to ask you to think about your feelings. And on top of that, doing that in a Lutheran church maybe seems a little blasphemous because sometimes it seems like, well, we don't care about feelings and we sure don't share our feelings. But that's what we're going to do this morning. In just a moment, I'm going to read to you the Ten Commandments. And I want to encourage you, as always, to listen to God's word But don't pay so much attention to what the commands are saying. We'll unpack that over the next nine weeks. I want you to think about how the commandments make you feel. On your worship guide, there's a little box. And in that little box, I want to encourage you to take out your pen and write down what you feel as you hear the Ten Commandments. So, Here they are. The Ten Commandments, our sermon lesson from Exodus chapter 20. Our focus today is going to be on the first six verses, but I'm going to read the first 20, which are all the verses of God giving Moses and Israel the commandments. Remember, Israel is gathered around Mount Sinai. They see Moses go up to the mountain. They see the cloud, and they're afraid. This is Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord God is giving you. You shall not murder. 
You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant or his don- ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke. They trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. This is the word of your God. The Ten Commandments, how do they make you feel? Did you feel enthused, excited to do all the commandments? Probably not many of you. Did you feel a sense of awe, a sense of respect, a sense of of reverence for God and his word? perhaps more of you. But the feeling, the feeling that most of you felt, whether you were able to label it or not, the feeling that the Ten Commandments make us feel is stuck. Let me explain that because there's really three different ways that the commandments make us feel stuck. The first is, as you listen to the commandments, you hear them read, and there's some, or at least one, where you know you have not kept it. You've sinned against it. And so you feel stuck. You feel caught, red-handed. There's no way out of it. You know you haven't kept it. You feel stuck or trapped, and the real feeling you are feeling It's called guilt. It's the first way we maybe feel stuck when confronted with the commandments. And the second is like it. You feel stuck because you know of guilt, but it doesn't stop there. The second is a cycle of never enough. It happens this way. You know God's word. You do. You know what God says. You know that he has given you the commandments. And so you want to keep the commandments. But maybe it's the first, then the third, then the eighth. Before long, you realize you are guilty of, well, breaking many of them. But you don't stay stuck in guilt. Oh no, not you. No, you're determined that next time it'll be different. Inspired to do better, to be more, to be better, you decide that this time you're going to keep the commandments. You're not going to break them. But it happens again. You fail and you sin. And maybe it's a whole list of them, or or maybe it's just one that happens over and over again, but you're stuck. You're stuck in a cycle of never enough. No matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, no matter how well you look at the commandments, study them, memorize them, look at other commandments in God's word, it's never enough. You never love God enough. You never worship him enough. You never read his word enough. You never serve him enough. You never love your neighbor enough, your spouse or your kids enough. You're never pure enough. You're never clean enough. You're stuck in a cycle of never enough. It's the second way that the commandments make us feel stuck. And well, here's the third. If the first two deal with guilt, the second one, the, excuse me, the third one deals more with shock. It's something felt by people who appreciate and, and people who also hate the commandments. You look at them, you read them, 
and it seems a whole lot like here is the wet blanket on my life. Here is a list of rules and commandments that are meant to choke all the fun out of life. Seriously, you're telling me that I am either to remain abstinent or married to one person my entire life. You're telling me that God not only wants to control what comes out of my mouth, but he wants to control what goes into my mouth and he wants to control other parts of my body. God wants me to not want, to not covet, and yet I still want to get ahead in life? No, this seems like it is a prison. How do the commandments make you feel? Like I'm stuck in a prison of rules and regulations. And to many, that's what the commandments, that's what Christianity seems like. I asked you how the commandments make you feel. Maybe it's stuck in guilt. Maybe it's stuck in a cycle of never enough, no matter how hard you try to keep them all. Maybe it's stuck in a prison of rules. But if stuck is the feeling that you're feeling when you look at the commandments, let me suggest that you're looking at them wrongly. Oh yes, the commandments are meant to point you to the guilt that you have, but God does not want you to stay stuck there. No, The commandments, they do, they make us conscious of our sin. Romans chapter 3 showed us that. But God has good for you in the commandments. God gives you good things in the commandments. There's good news in the commandments, and that's my prayer with this series. My prayer with this whole series is that you look at the commandments You listen to the commandments with new eyes and new ears, eyes of faith, the lens of Christ, and you see that in the commandments, yes, they make you conscious of your sin, but they also lead you to cling to Christ. Let me unpack that for just a moment. We looked at Romans chapter three earlier that said, there's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All people have turned away. They have all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Verse 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then verse 20 says this, there will be no one declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. In other words, there is no one who is going to be declared right with God because they worked the law. They did the commandments. They kept them all. No one is declared righteous by what they do. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The first purpose of the law is that the Ten Commandments is to make us conscious of our sin. If you're filling along in, following along in your worship guide and filling in the blanks, that's the first one. The Ten Commandments, their purpose, their goal is to make us conscious of our sin. Look, it's a bit of a wake-up call, but the Ten Commandments are not your personal, moral, or ethical to-do list. They are not a list of rules that if you do them, you're going to just get a little bit better, a little bit closer with God. This is going to sound a little bit backwards, but the law, the Ten Commandments, does not describe what you can do. It describes what you should do, but you cannot do. Let me say that again. The commandments describe what you should do, but what you cannot do. And that's how the law and the Ten Commandments makes you conscious of your sin. Say, Matt, (laughs) I thought you wanted us to look at these commandments in a new way, a fresh way, and, and see the good that God has in store for us there. That doesn't sound so great. You're right. That first purpose of the law is a beastly one. But more beautifully, the purpose of the law, after you're conscious of your sin, is to make us cling to Christ. 
The purpose of the law is to let us see that we have no power or strength in ourselves to keep all of the Ten Commandments, at least not all of the time. And that's what God demands in the commandments, in the law. And so what does he do? Well, through the law, he makes us aware of our sin and our need for a savior. And through his word, he moves us to crawl and to cling to Christ. And there, what do you receive? Forgiveness. You receive freedom from being stuck in guilt. You receive freedom and liberation from the cycle of guilt and a life of love in him. What do you receive from him? You see release from the prison of your own making that the law is bad, but rather through the spirit working in you, through the faith that he's given to you, you know a life of new, holy, and pure desires. That's the purpose of the commandments, to make us conscious of our sin, but also to make us cling to Christ. And no more apparent is that than in the first commandment. First, let me give you one more fun fact. This is what I wanted to call the series. I wanted to call our series, God is so good because God is the guardian of the great gifts that God gives, a study in the 10 commandments. Thankfully, wiser people prevailed and we're calling it just the guardian. But by the grace of God, I wanna restate the point of this whole series. It's that you know this, that God is good. He gives you good gifts. He gives you good gifts in the commandments and in the commandments, he guards you, your heart, your life, your soul, so that you receive all of the great gifts and blessings that God gives. That's what the commandments are all about. And that's what this first commandment highlights so beautifully. The commandment is this, you shall have no other gods. What does that mean? What does it mean to have a God? What is God? Well, a God is anything to which you look for good. A God is anything or anyone in which you seek to find happiness, purpose, comfort, confidence, safety, pleasure, anything that you look to for joy and hope, that, that is a God. And in this commandment, God starts off by saying this. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Right off the bat, it is as though God is saying, look, whatever you need, look to me for it. Whatever good you lack, I will give it to you. Whatever you want, whatever you crave, seek it in me. If you are in stress or distress, if you are in danger or sadness, don't go looking anywhere else, but look to me. Just trust in me and I will give you all these good things. Only don't let your heart cling to anything else. That's the first commandment. And in this series, we're calling this first week the guardian of number one. And the reason is because oftentimes people refer to themselves as number one. I'm just looking out for number one. But what God is doing in this first commandment, he's looking out for you. Number one in God's priority list is guarding your heart. And he wants to guard the throne that sits on your heart. He wants, number one, to be there himself. And so that's what he's doing in this commandment. He's guarding your heart. And it's important that he does. Why? Well, because idols, idols are insidious and fake gods are are really sneaky All day long, there are small g gods that are looking to sit on that throne in your heart. Why is that? Well, God made us people, God made our hearts that worship, that want to worship, that want to cling to something. 
And so we look to cling for anything and worship anything that will give us good, that will give us happiness, that will give us purpose, that will give us pleasure and peace and joy and refuge and safety and hope and purpose and identity. And it doesn't have to be a Sunday morning and we don't have to be at church to worship. Our heart just has to look for and cling to those things. So what are you worshiping? What does your heart cling to? Yesterday, this past week, where did you go for joy, for peace, for pleasure and purpose, for safety and confidence? It could be something petty, something shallow, like money or sex or pride. Could be something good, something like family, something like friends or holidays or vacation or exercise or food. But people are complicated. Hearts are complicated. And the idols we manufacture there are often complicated as well could be a relationship that we value over and above our relationship with Jesus. It could be an identity, a sense of worth that finds itself outside of Christ. What are you worshiping? Because we're all worshiping something. And so the real question is what you are worshiping, is it worth it? That's the question to consider. We all worship something, so what are we worshiping? And is it worth it to worship that? Oftentimes, the easiest example for us to go to is is maybe with someone who struggles with a particular and an open sin. Maybe someone who, who struggles with a substance. And we look at them and we say, look, they're trying to get something out of that 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 wasn't supposed to provide. But looking into the eyes of an addict is no different than looking into the eyes of any sinner. We all crave things. We all compete all of the time. We all despise people whom we need and people we don't. We're greedy, we're selfish, we're arrogant. We desire, we desire, we want things. And so we go and we look for them. And if it isn't God, what you have is an idol on your heart. So what are you worshiping? In order to show how serious God is about this command. He attaches a threat to it. God says this, he says, you shall have no other gods before me for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. You wanna know how serious God is about having the number one spot on your heart and him and him alone being there? He says, I'm not only going to punish you if you perpetually break this, but I promise to also punish your children and your grandchildren and your great and your great, great grandchildren. That's the threat. That's the threat and the punishment that God promises with this commandment. But greater and more strong and more beautiful than the threat, this command has a promise. God's word says, you shall have no other gods before me, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the sins of the parents, punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But, but, showing Love to a thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You want to know how serious God is about this commandment? 
He's so serious that he promises that those who keep this commandment, those who honor this commandment, those who by the faith that God has gifted to them cling hold and hold fast to him, oh, he's not just going to show love to you and bless you, but his blessings transcend into a thousand generations. Look, there is a curse in this command, like a hammer hanging over us. There is this constant, constant demand ringing in our ears that what should we do? We should have no other gods. We should worship no other thing. We should look for good in nobody else. We should doubt never that God is the one who gives us good. And anytime we don't do that, there's a hammer ready to drop on us and generations after us and punish us. But what this promise makes clear is that that threat, it's been removed. Well, actually, it fell. It fell on Christ, and Christ has removed that threat, removed that punishment for us. How? Well, by suffering in our place. Just before we read Romans 3, well, here is Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 and 13. It reads, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. That means that anyone who relies on the commandments, doing them, keeping them, working to keep all of them perfectly all of the time, you live under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. But, but Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Friends, there is freedom in this command. There's freedom from the guilt that you feel stuck in. There's freedom from the cycle of never enough that we trap ourselves in by trying to keep these commandments all of the time, even though these commandments do not describe what you can do. They describe what you should do, but what you can't do. And there's freedom. There's freedom from seeing these commandments as a sort of prison that looks to hold us back in life. But to instead see here in these commandments There is good. There is a good God who promises to guard your heart and to give you Christ and his forgiveness. When we we study the commandments, we hear these ringing in our ears. You shall have no other gods. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to worship anything besides God. But for just a moment, let all those demands fade away. Let all those demands fade away and and hear what God is saying to you in this commandment. Cling to me. Believe in me. And I will show you love. I will bless you when you are in me and I am in you. I will give you good. You ever stop to ponder the simple words of it? The next fill in the blank is just this. We call God by a name that is derived from the word good. God is good. And when God gives to you, he he gives only his good to you. Yes, even in the commandments. You have not started to live until you have said enough, enough to the guilt that the laws make you feel. And and it should, but it should stop there. You shouldn't be stuck there. You have not started to live until you've said enough to the law, making you feel guilty, making you feel like you're stuck in a cycle of never enough and started to see that you are enough because Christ died for you. You have not started to live until you have stopped trying to keep all of the laws perfectly and obtain a righteousness or a rightness with God by doing the law and instead, and instead stopped and simply received righteousness that comes from God, righteousness that is given by faith. You haven't started living until you have stopped trying to pull a Nike and just do it, just do all of the commandments, but instead stop and see what the commandments are. They're not a list of things that you can do. They're a list of things you should do, but you can't do. 
but Christ has done them all for you. And on top of that, as a cherry on top, has given you his full and free salvation. Some of you know that over the past couple of weeks, <clears throat> I've been gone on vacation and I uh, got to really enjoy some time with my family. When people go on vacation, it's kind of because they need a rest from their work. And yes, even, even pastors, I suppose, need that. And when people are trying to look for a little rest and relaxation, they try not to think about work. That's hard, you know? <laughs> that was hard for me to do, uh, especially because that means that I would have to stop thinking about all of you. And I did think about all of you, collectively, individually. And when I do, I would pray for you as I normally do. But I also knew when I come back and I, and I get to see you, I'd be preaching on this, the first commandment. I thought to myself, what do you say? <laughs> what do you say to a group of people who by the world standards, are good people. You know that, right? You know that. You're good people. You're people who, who want to do good. You want to do Christianity good. Well, you want to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You want to love your neighbor as yourself. So what do you say in response to the commandments to people who want that? You ready what I thought of? Stop. Stop trying and start resting. Stop working and start clinging. Stop trying to do all the laws and keep them perfectly and it, Instead, stop and start resting in a God who by his own outstretched arms holds you in the palm of his hand and says, look, you are here with me. Just, just hold on. Just cling to me. Stop worrying about the question of, oh, I'm a Christian. Now what do I do? And start just worshiping and clinging to a God who has called you, who has done everything for you, and then changes you from the inside out, transforms you so that you have holy, new, good, and pure desires to do things for you, to do things for him, to do things for your neighbor. What's the purpose of the commandments? Yes, it has a beastly purpose, and that is to make you conscious of your sin. But don't stay stuck there. The purpose of the commandments is to move your heart by the spirit-worked faith that he has gifted you to cling to Christ. And there believe in him. There rest in him. There find freedom in him. There find that every single day you live deliberately in the staggering grace of God who holds you and keeps you even as he commands you to keep hold of him. He is the one holding on to you. Be there and what you will find is that you are free indeed. You are not stuck. You are free to live. You are free to love. You are free to love the Lord your God. You're free to love your neighbor. You're free to do any number of things on the list of the Ten Commandments. You're free to go about loving Jesus, to just be clinging to Jesus and really do whatever else you want. And who knows? Maybe even doing some commandments along the way. May God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. 